This is session 2AW, Introduction to Groovy Scripting. Okay. Um, um, sorry. No problem. Go ahead. <laughs> Take okay. your time. Sorry. There's a bit of a delay here. I think we've got lots of... Uh... Okay. Sounds good. All right. So, yeah, my name is Daniel Briss. Um, I'm a IBM architect. Uh, I work on a product uh, called IBM dependency based build. Um, this is a, 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 it's a Java based product used primarily to, uh, build, uh, ZOS applications like COBOL, PO1 and, uh, assembler, um, as part of a, uh, a DevOps pipeline. Uh, so, um, it would be a process that you would run and execute um, off of uh, CI CD servers like Jenkins or uh, GitLab CI or Microsoft Azure. Um, let's see. Let's get this. All right. Um, and just to, as a reminder, um, the, we would, uh, as part of the uh, GSC UK conference, uh, we would uh, encourage anybody. Uh, who wants to uh, contribute to charity to look at the uh, charity raffles and the, uh, the uh, charities that uh, the conference is uh, being supported by. Okay, um, so let's step into this. Um, so in the last couple of years, um, I, I, if, uh, if, I don't know if anyone noticed, but there's a lot of new technologies coming to the mainframe to the ZOS system. It's not just COBOL and PO1 and assembler anymore. Um, now we, you see languages on ZOS like Node.js and Python. Uh, and recently they just ported over a uh, Go or sometimes known as Golang. Um, and uh, what I'll be talking about today is uh, Groovy as well. And, and this is part of the modernization, but also it, it's, it's helping us uh, achieve some other uh, goals we're trying to do. A lot around automation tools, uh, automatic automation tools that we want to have running on ZOS. So you'll see that, you know, we actually now have, uh, we've got a team working on porting Ansible playbooks that will run on ZOS. Um, now, uh, let's clarify, Ansible actually is an off-box uh, kind of uh, uh, automation tool that pushes uh, you know, uh, configuration and, and automation onto the ZOS. But um, if you're familiar with ZOS, it isn't more, there's Unix system services, um, USS, that has the hierarchical file system that most uh, distributed uh, tools know about. But what they don't know about, of course, is the ZOS file system, the data sets and such like that. Um, and um, we have a team in IBM that are being creating Python playbooks for Ansible that understand how to interact with the ZOS uh, file system. So you can uh, configure, create, delete, and copy over uh, data set members uh, using these new tools. Uh, Jenkins, which is a CI CD uh, server as part of the uh, pipeline. Um, this, uh, you know, runs mostly as a Java process, but Jenkins, just like uh, Ansible can run pretty much any kind of language, the pr preferred language it wants to run is Python. Um, Jenkins is sort of the same way. Um, it could run, execute any kind of language, but its preferred language is Groovy. Uh, and, and then finally, um, recently, we're in this process of uh, get, uh, so also Jenkins would run as a server in a cloud but it has a, a an agent that can run on USS and that's a Java process. But again, scripting, writing pipeline scripts is usually using either Groovy or a, uh, a Groovy domain uh, specific language, a DSL for the pipeline scripts. Um, and GitLab CI, uh, GitLab is uh, uh, another like cloud-based uh, Git uh, repository like uh, GitHub or Bitbucket. But GitLab also has branched out into the CI CD uh, pipeline as well. So it's got a GitLab CI. This would be like a competitor to Jenkins. And uh, in the same way where Jenkins has got a remote agent running on the box on USS, that's in Java, GitLab CI also has an agent that would run on the, the box too. And that's written in Go. And like I said, IBM recently has ported Go to USS and primarily for getting uh, working with GitLab to get their agent to run on USS. 
But today um, I'm going to be highlighting the benefits of using Groovy on ZOS. Um, as part of DBB, so uh, like I said, uh, the product I work on is IBM dependency based build, uh, affectionately known as DBB. Um, it is a Java based API. Um, but we wanted to be able to, it's a low level API. So the idea is that you would write your own build scripts um, to do what you need to do as part of your uh, pipeline. And we were looking around for different types of scripts that was available. This is back in 2017. Um, we didn't really want customers to be writing Java applications to use our Java APIs. Um, build scripts uh, are obviously simpler, light, more lightweight. Java, of course, brings in uh, things like object-oriented programming that might be difficult. And of course, you'd have to compile Java programs into class files and jar files to use them. So we were looking at a couple of different possibilities at the time. Uh, we were looking at Ant. Um, we were looking at Maven. We were even looking at Gradle. Um, and we sort of rejected the first two, uh, Ant and Maven, just because they're XML-based scripts. And it's uh, sort of difficult. We also were looking at Maven and Gradle because they are actually uh, build scripting languages. But at the time, we felt that they were more centered around building Java applications. And we, of course, were trying to put together a tool that customers could use to build COBOL programs and PL1 programs. So it wasn't really a good fit. And then we found Groovy, which actually was very good. Um, and we'll talk about the benefits here in a second. But Groovy is a scripting language. Um, also, it's a Java-based scripting language. So it interacts with Java APIs very well. Um, so I've been using Groovy since 2017. And I, today, what I'm going to do is probably do a little quick overview of Groovy. Uh, I want to talk about how you would get Groovy and install it and get it working on USS. It's Java-based, so you don't have to worry about porting it to uh, USS. But there is one or two caveats about installing it that I'll cover. Um, and then, since we only really have an hour, I just want to do an introduction to Groovy and, and discuss some of the syntax highlights of what Groovy is and why it's a, it's a more modern version of Java in some ways. Um, and then at the end, we have some links and I can answer any questions that you have. So, uh, so what is Groovy? And, you know, the first couple lines here, um, like it's an object, it is by definition, it's an object oriented language and it's Java syntax com compatible language. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but basically, it's a superset of Java. So any job, almost any Java syntax will work in a Groovy script. You can actually copy and paste Java from a Java source file and put it into a Groovy script and it will execute. Um, but it was specifically designed to be a scripting language for the, the JVM for the Java virtual machine. Um, so it really isn't a com com it isn't competing against Java, it's extending Java. Java has to be compiled before you can use it. And then you have to create class files or jar files. But uh, Groovy doesn't have to be compiled. It's scripting. It's, it's, it's a, like a, any other script. It, you, you run it from the command line, and it's an interpreted uh, on the fly. Um, and it's also it's a, it's a more modern language, too. So it, it, while it does support all Java syntax, it also introduces the new elements uh, like what you see like dynamic uh, typing um, and like other types of more powerful features that you see in Python and Ruby and uh, small talk. And the other thing that's cool about this is that learning Groovy, especially if you're a Java developer is very easy. I mean, it's very familiar with it. And in many times the new syntax is actually just more powerful and simplified versions of Java syntax, some of the things that you might find irritating about Java, like, you know, every time you want to use a string, you have to say, well, if the string is not null and the length, the string's length is greater than zero, in, in Groovy, you just say, if string. And then, you know, stuff like that, a lot of shortcuts are built into the language. And it seamlessly integrates with Java. I mean, it is Java, these uh, Groovy scripts, get compiled into Java classes dynamically. And it, it interacts perfectly. All existing Java classes uh, in the standard library and any 
jar files that you've written yourself can be used easily by Groovy. And that's why we chose Groovy as our uh, scripting language for our samples and for our applications for DBB. And as I mentioned before, Groovy scripts are dynamically compiled at runtime into Java bytecode. So Groovy runs wherever Java runs. And Java runs pretty much anywhere, including on ZOS. IBM provides a JVM that runs on ZOS, um, on USS, but it also has some additional libraries that are very useful. Like they have the JSOS library, which allows you to not only read files and write files on USS, but you can read and write to data sets on the ZOS file system as well. Um, some of the groovy features that I think are worth uh, bringing uh, forward is um, it does have support for dynamic typing. It uses the defined DEF keyword. Um, so you can say it's an int, it's a float, it's a string, it's a Boolean, uh, or you can just say def, you know, a name, and then it will be defined at runtime. It has some native support for arrays, maps, and regular expressions. Um, so you can always go back to the Java and use the array class or the array classes and interfaces and the maps and the regular expression uh, classes. But it has some built-in types and some operators that make this quicker and easier to use and simpler to understand. Uh, there's some string enhancements that I'll be talking about, uh, string interpolation, um, where you can have uh, you can just embed variables into a st quoted string. Um, and it gets resolved um, at runtime and printed out. You don't have to put in a whole bunch of concatenation lines to do so. Um, and multi-line strings too. Um, it makes it very easy if you have a chunk of code that you want to have it pre-formatted in your source file. You don't have to, again, worry about new lines and concatenation characters. It has native support for XML and JSON processing. It's got you know, DOM objects and uh, JSON objects, and also does parsing and as well as writing as well. Um, and though it's considered an object-oriented language because it is an extension off of uh, Java, um, the scripting, the, the Ruby scripting provides a more functional programming paradigm. Um, so you define classes, you can define statements and methods and Groovy scripts without having to put them inside a class declaration. Um, and also there are things like called closures, which we'll talk about in a little bit, bit that are sort of like method pointers or like anonymous uh, methods that can be passed around. That makes it pretty powerful. So a brief history on Groovy. Um, so basically in 2003, a, a developer uh, blogged about this idea of having a Java scripting language, uh, James uh, Stratton. Um, and he started working on Groovy uh, in 2003. And in 2004, if you're familiar with it, uh, Java has a JCP, a Java community process where uh, new uh, uh, designs uh, can be submitted and voted on a community and supported. So a JSR was open for Groovy. Now, the interesting thing about that is that um, it sort of became uh, obsolete. It was like unattended, and I think they eventually closed it. Even though Groovy came out the door, um, it really didn't uh, go out as part of the JSR process after it was proposed. I think they eventually closed the JSR down uh, in 2012 as being uh, abandoned or something like that. In 2007, the first uh, Groovy 1.0 was released. Uh, following and, and then there's a lot of uh, sub point releases in here too that I didn't really cover every release like a 1.1 a 1.2 a 1.3 or 1.31 will have some new uh, features added to it that you can go look at the change logs for. Um, but in 2012 groovy 2.0 was released and the one of the interesting things again a lot of new content and a lot of new function, but what I thought was sort of striking was that. Um, in Groovy 2.0, even though it was designed to be a scripting language, um, they did add support for static compiling of Groovy. So you can actually do have a Groovy compiler that could create Java jar files. And this just, I think, just sort of adds to the idea that in addition to being a scripting language, a lot of the new syntax, a lot of the new uh, operators that are powerful are sort of, in some cases, I think, fun to use, 
uh, is attractive. So you can go ahead and create groovy jar files that interact with uh, Java classes. And since they're all in the same class path on the same J J JVM, they can be used interchangeably. Now in 20, so there was a private company that was basically uh, uh, doing the groovy development. It was open source, but a private company sort of owned it for a while there. Um, and, uh, and, but in 2015, um, Groovy was moved over to the Apache Software Foundation and has become a project. So now if you wanna get Groovy, um, I think that was the 2.3 uh, release or 2.4 release uh, is when it moved over. Um, now, if you want to get Groovy, you would go to Apache to uh, get the, the Groovy stuff. The current stable version of Groovy is Groovy uh, 309. Um, and there is a Groovy 4.0 in beta at this point in time. All right, so I wanna go over, uh, uh, talk about installing Groovy on USS. For the most part, it's pretty simple because Groovy is Java. As long as there's a JVM installed, then you can run Groovy. Uh, and so you don't have to worry about porting it. You don't have to worry about, you know, recompiling it for uh, ZOS. But there is one caveat it's on the next slide and I, I wanna make sure that you know about that. Um, so as a prerequisite, to run Groovy, you definitely need to have Java installed on your system. And uh, also in some of the configuration I'll, I'll be talking about in a minute, you should know where that Java is installed because you're gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna set up some environmental variables that point to the Java installation. So you just go ahead and uh, from your workstation, just go to the uh, Apache Groovy website. There's a link there for the latest version 309 and you go ahead and download the, the Groovy distribution uh, onto your workstation. Now I found that um, I want to unzip this when I get it onto USS and I just want to use the default values. So I found that it, Apache dash Groovy dash binary dash 309 is just a little uh, long to be using um, all this stuff. So I'll, I found it simpler. Once I downloaded the file into my workstation, it just renamed the zip file just to groovy309.zip. And this is going to create a folder structure where it's now groovy-3.0.9. I mean, that's a lot easier to uh, add into my uh, environmental variables and my path variables. So once you've done this, you want to FTP the zip file from your workstation up to USS and make sure that uh, you use binary mode. Some FTP tools uh, will default to text mode. And if you upload the file using text mode, it's going to screw up the uh, zip package altogether. So once you get the file up onto uh, USS where you want to put it, um, then you just go ahead and use unzip, which is a USS tool command. So unzip Ruby uh, 309.zip. Now, this is the big caveat here. Um, while you don't have to port uh, Groovy over to USS like you would if it was a C application or a, a Go application or any other compiled application, um, you do have to uh, take into mind that you're going to be running Groovy from the command line. You're going to be using the keyword Groovy. And that's located in the Groovy bin directory. Now, these aren't compiled programs. Groovy and Java and Ant, and I'm sure Maven and Gradle, they all actually use shell scripts uh, or bat files. If you open up the bin directory in Groovy, you're going to see a Groovy and a Groovy.bat file. The bat file is how you would start Groovy, run Groovy on Windows. Uh, the Groovy uh, is actually a shell script. Now, on any other system besides ZOS, um, these files are in UTF-8 code page, um, and they would work perfectly fine. Unfortunately, on ZOS, uh, shell scripts have to be in, they have to be either in EBCDIC or they have to be uh, file tagged as ASCII, and you have to turn auto convert on. I didn't go into the details of doing that mechanism because there's several extra steps to do it. Uh, I find it easier just to find these two files, Groovy and Start Groovy, both in the bin directory, um, and convert those to EBCDIC. There are a lot more shell scripts in there, depending on what you want to do. Like there's a Groovy C. If you eventually want to compile your Groovy 
source files into jar files, you'd have to do the same thing with Groovy C. These two files are required because you're gonna be calling Groovy from the command line. It's gonna do like one or two things inside that shell script. And then it's immediately gonna call start Groovy, which is gonna then bootstrap Groovy up and start a JVM and everything like that too. So the, both of these files have to be converted to EBCDIC in order to run correctly. And you can use icon V to convert the code pages. And here's an example on how you do this. One interesting thing, if you're not familiar, icon V on USS um, does not actually output to a file. It actually will go ahead and do the code page conversion and output to standard out. So you need to redirect standard out into a file and you can't redirect it into the same file. So you see there's two commands here. I'm doing an icon V from UTF-8 to IBM 1047 of the Groovy file and I'm redirecting it into a temp file in that Groovy directory. And then I immediately move or uh, you know, copy over the temp file over the existing Groovy file with this new version that's in the correct code page. I do that for both of those files. All right, so now we have Groovy installed and we have the two shell scripts set up so that now you can execute them um, from the USS command line. But before we run Groovy, we need to do one more thing here. Um, we need to set up some environmental variables. And uh, the easiest way to do this is just do this in your dot profile file in USS. If you're using bash on uh, USS, you can put this into your dot uh, bash file as well. Um, and just as an important note, depending on how you're editing this dot profile, if you're actually logged into USS and you're using VI or you're using ISPF, I think, 15 to allow you to edit uh, USS files. You're going to have to, once you make these changes, you're gonna to have to log out and log back in again for these changes to take effect. Now, if you're using a tool uh, that allows you to do remote uh, editing, like uh, IDZ um, or uh, Zoe, <laughs> Joe, um, then um, you would you would just, then you just have to log in for these, uh, uh, environmental variables to take effect. So the three, uh, you're going to set up, uh, we're going to set up uh, two environmental variables and you're probably going to uh, append to an existing environmental variable. So you want to set Java home. And this is where I was telling you earlier that, you know, make sure that Java is installed on your system and also note where it's installed at. Um, in this case here, I think the standard uh, installation for Java, because usually your sysadmin is going to set this up is in the slash user slash uh, LPP directory. And this one I'm uh, pointing to uh, Java version eight. Um, you set up a Groovy home as well. In this case here, I'm just showing you an example. I wanna play with this. So I went ahead and installed it in my own directory. So I set up uh, in uh, slash u slash dbruce. I went ahead and uh, this is where I extracted out the Groovy-309 zip file and it created a Groovy-309 uh, folder. And this is the home directory for the Groovy installation. And then finally, so that I can just type Groovy from the command line um, or Java from the command line if I wanna do this, I just go ahead and add the bin directories to my path. Um, so you can see I have Java home slash bin, uh, Groovy home slash bin, and then I put that in front of the path statement. So now when I type Groovy, after I've logged out and logged back in again, and when I type Groovy, I'll go ahead and invoke the correct Groovy shell script, the one that's been converted. And then finally, you can just do a quick test your Groovy installation. Just type in Groovy dash dash version, and you should get back uh, something that says, and if it's all installed correctly, you should get back something that says, you know, Groovy version 309. It'll tell you the JVM that's being used by Groovy and the vendor and the operating system for the JVM. Um, just a few things about Groovy and Java syntax I just wanted to highlight, and I think I mentioned this before, but basically almost all existing Java syntax is valid Groovy syntax. So you can pretty much use any Groovy, uh, any Java, and you can copy that and paste it. I mean, even class definitions, enumerations, uh, it's all supported by Groovy. 
Um, so that does also make testing Java pretty quick and easy if you don't want to compile the Java and turn it into a jar class file and uploader or something like that. You can just go ahead and copy it and paste it into a Groovy file and then just run Groovy on it. I think when I say almost, I think there's a few uh, glitches. I think like the systems class, like system.out.println, there's some issues with some of the system methods. But like you'll see in, in some of the examples here, like they just simplified some things. So like you don't have to say a system.out.println, you can just say print line in Groovy, you know, go ahead and print that out to the console. Uh, semicolons at the end of statements are optional. So if you copy in Java, you can leave the semicolons on the end of the statements and it'll run perfectly fine. But if you're running Groovy from scratch, then forget the semicolons and you don't need them anymore. And just like Java, there are import statements. Um, so if you want to use uh, some class from Java or from Groovy, you'd have to use an import statement. However, just like Java has a default import for java.lang, so you don't have to say java.lang, um, Groovy has the same thing, but also it's added several other common packages. So Java IO, Java Net, Java Util, Groovy Lang, Groovy Util, and Big Integer and Big Decimal. These are all automatically imported into your Groovy scripts. So you don't have to declare them at all. So that makes some, depending on what you're trying to do, of course, but some simple Groovy scripts, you can get away with no import statements altogether. Um, the other thing I want to bring out too is Groovy uses objects for everything. So really there's no primitives in Groovy. If you define a primitive like here int x equals five, actually Groovy is going to auto wrap that. Um, and so like if I were to go ahead and say, you know, assert x is an instance of an integer, um, it would come back as true. Um, I also want to mention a little bit, in, in a lot of examples, you're going to see me using the assert clause. If you're familiar with JUnit, um, there's a lot of uh, asserts that can just assert if, uh, you know, one condition is true or of another condition and print a, an optional message you want that. Um, Groovy has this built into the syntax. So the, the standard format is basically assert uh, expression um, and then a colon and then a message of what could be printed uh, out if the expression, if the assert fails. Um, also, uh, if assert does fail, you'll see a nice little uh, ASCII art uh, table branching telling you, okay, this is the value of X and this, uh, the condition was false or true or something like that. It's pretty interesting. So you'll see a lot of samples when you're looking at the Groovy documentation and they're talking about how these things work. Um, they'll just use the assert uh, method to show you that this this is going to produce this value and this is the true value of it. So you'll see a lot of it in the examples as we go forward. Um, so talking about Groovy scripts. Um, so the Groovy scripts are interpreted like any other scripts at runtime. Um, but what's different is that the Groovy scripts are uh, dynamically interpreted and then they, they're dynamically compiled into actual Java classes in, into bytecode. Um, so there's really not magic and knowing how some of this works does help you a little bit. So here's your standard hello world dot uh, groovy file right and it's a single line. Um, script basically print line hello world like I talked about before and in print line remember is a shortened version of system got out dot print line. So it's a one line script and it would print a uh, hello world to the uh, output. When we execute uh, hello world.groovy, um, it actually will be dynamically compiled into a class, in which case the name of the class is the name of the Groovy script file. So you'll see there it's creating a class called hello world. And it is a, uh, it extends the script base class because this is a Groovy script. And you can see in this case, there's, there's other stuff going on, but these are the two biggest things you're going to see. You're going to see the fact that there is a run method, and then there is a static void main method, just like Java. So you would execute this from the command line. It would call static void main, pass in the string array of args. Now it uses a helper class to run this script in which you're passing in the class you want to run and the args to it. 
And then eventually it's going to set up the args as a, in a bindings object that's, uh, that's global to this class. But then I was going to call the run method and all the statements from the Groovy script were copied over to the run method. So this has all happened dynamically. It's happening very quickly. And then when you execute this from the command line, you would just type groovy, hello world.groovy, and the results would come back and it would say hello world. Uh, so in addition to having statements in a script, you can also define methods. Um, so here I have this uh, script called power.groovy. And in it here, I've got two statements and I've got a method definition. And one of the statements is going to invoke the method. Um, I, the order doesn't matter here, because remember, we're not actually executing this script. The script was parsed and it was converted into a Java class and we're executing the main on the Java class, right? So. The order doesn't matter. I could have that method definition at the bottom. I could have it at the top. I could have it anywhere. But I did put it here because I want to show you that when Groovy is parsing this script and compiling it into a class, it's actually doing a couple of things. Like any statement outside of a method definition, it's putting them into the run method in the compiled class. But that any method definition in the script is just added as a class method. So you can see when it gets compiled, um, a class power extends script. And then now there is the power method uh, defined as a class method. And then there is the run method. And where you can see in order, the first free statement is using the power method and then another print line where we're actually printing out the uh, a string, and we're going to talk about string interpolation, but that a dollar sign and the open and close curly brace is how you can go ahead and insert a uh, an expression. It could be another variable. It could be, in this case, a method call. It could be a calculation. You can insert that into a string, and that value will be converted automatically. And it will print out the actual value of that power. And then there's a static void main. The, the last thing I want to talk about scripts is script variables, because this might not be intuitive. When you have, let's say I have my Groovy script here and it's got three lines. It's got int x equals one, int y equals two, and we're printing out the, the value x, y equals again, another interpolation of x plus y. In that case, I've got a numeric expression going on that'll be converted and when it's printed into the screen, string. But actually what happened is all three of those statements are put into the run uh, method. But that does mean that X and Y now are local variables to the run. So if I wanted to then call a method, I would actually have to pass X and Y into that method. That method would not be able to see those variables because they're local to the run method. But if you want to have global variables, like if you want to create class variables, you would use the field annotation. So in this case here, I use the groovy field annotation, int x equals one and uh, y equals two. Now these become class variables and you see the same thing. So now when you look at the compilation, the class test extends script, uh, but now you can see that x and y are class variables and then the run only has a print statement, but that does now mean that the run method could call other methods and you wouldn't have to pass in X and Y because they're global class variables or instance variables. Um, so the rest of this presentation, and I have some links at the end uh, we can talk about, but mostly, um, you know, we only have an hour and basically we were used up over a half hour of it already. Um, so uh, there's a lot of links to, you know, to documentation, to guides, to self-paced guides, to other resources I can learn about Groovy. Um, and as we talked about, Groovy can use, you can use straight Java and Groovy you want. 
But Groovy brings in a lot of new syntactical items. They sometimes they call them syntactical sugar. And it makes Groovy uh, fun to use and, and more powerful. And there's a lot of them. And I highly encourage you to take a look at the documentation if you're interested after this presentation. And like I said, I provide links. But I'm going to just go through and talk about the ones that I like using that I've been using a lot for the last couple of years and, and why I think they're interesting and stuff like that. So we'll talk about some string enhancements I like that Groovy had introduced, uh, native support for lists and maps, um, uh, some interesting new operators, uh, Groovy truth uh, on how you can uh, evaluate non-Boolean expressions as true or false and how it handles that. Uh, some method enhancements that are pretty interesting that I've been using and uh, a brief introduction to closures. There's a lot about closures. I, I gave you a little bit of a talk about closures, but more uh, in context of what you can do with closures, especially when it comes to uh, uh, list uh, looping uh, and around through lists and maps and stuff. So we might run out of time. I'll try to keep my uh, eye on the clock. Um, uh, if we run out of time before I, I finish these, these slides. All right, so string enhancements. In Groovy, Groovy actually has two types of strings and it uses single quotes and double quotes to differentiate between the two. Um, so in Java, a single quote is really a character, um, but in Groovy, a single quote is actually just a plain simple Java string, nothing special about it. When it's compiled into the Java class, these just become Java strings. But double quoted strings are the more powerful ones. These are called Groovy strings of type uh, groovy.lang.gstring. And this is what supports the interpolation that I was talking about earlier. Um, so in this case here, you can see um, in the first example here, we're defining uh, a, a name uh, equals Henry. And actually, since I'm using single quotes, that's just a plain old Java string. Um, and then I define a greeting where I'm saying, hello, and then I'm using the interpolation, the, the dollar sign open and quote braces and the variable in there, in that. So before that uh, string is created, it will substitute that variable, that name variable with the actual value of Henry in it. Um, and then as you can see, you can assert, now that greeting at this point is, a groovy string, right? So we need to convert it to a plain string to do a comparison with another plain string just to make sure that they're equal. And also in groovy, um, you'll see that uh, they use the equality symbol equal equal for everything. Um, since everything is an object, um, you don't have to worry about equal equal works on primitives, but you have to use the dot equals method to work on object. Groovy, what happens, this is the cool thing about it being dynamically compiled. Uh, the Groovy syntax understands that, okay, these are going to be two objects. So I'm going to, I'm going to, when I generate the Java class, I'm going to switch that equal equal out to a dot equals method. So it's, it's pretty uh, powerful on that one here. In the second scenario, I think I mentioned this before, um, now we're actually uh, not just referencing a variable, but we're actually doing an operation. Um, the sum of two and three equals, again, dollar sign, uh, open and close curly brace, two plus three. So that's gonna be resolved into five. And then you can see here, we're just uh, verifying that uh, when we do a two string off of that sum, because it is a groovy string, it does equal the sum of two and three equals five. It's been substituted. In the last example, um, I could, you could see where we're not using curly braces. And, and technically, in the first example, because it was just a simple variable, we could, get, we could have just said hello dollar sign name. Um, but you have to be careful when you're using the dollar sign name. Um, the, the, the formal thing is dollar sign open and close curly brace, and that works everywhere. But sometimes a dollar sign name can work too if it's a simple expression. I could not say dollar sign two plus three, that wouldn't make any sense. Um, and that's, uh, and also in this, in this final example, I want to show you how we're saying person we're defining as a map and maps coming up. 
Um, and you can see that we've got a map with two keys, uh, name with a value of Henry and age with a value of 36. And you can uh, reference uh, keys in a map by using the map variable name and a dot uh, nomenclature. Um, so in this case here, you can see I say I'm using dot per, uh, dollar sign person, which is going to resolve person to the person class. And then I can say dot name. But that dot is the delimiter of the, uh, the interpolation for person. Um, so this is why in certain cases, uh, a dollar sign is, is very useful. I could have also said um, uh, dollar sign open um, curly brace person dot name close curly brace that would have the same effect too. And here you can see that that string was converted into Henry is 36 years old. Another string enhancement that I like are multi line strings too. Um, so this sort of saves you all the concatenation and all the new lines and all the string declarations that you would have to do in Java to do the same thing here. You can just use triple quoted strings and that will preserve white space, including new lines, tabs, spaces, indentation, stuff like that. So a triple single quoted string is a Java string. Um, so like you define a multi-line here equals uh, three single quotes, line one, and then indented line two. It's been moved over two spaces or three spaces, and then line three. Now, you can do a triple double quoted strings, and those are groovy strings, which would support interpolation. So in this example here, I've created a simple string indented line two, and then I've created my multi-line with triple double quotes. And I've got line one, and then I've got, uh, I've indented the indented variable. I could have either indented into the value, or in this case, I just went ahead and indented that. And then line three, and then that would have the same thing. Now, the annoying thing about this, of course, is that all white space is preserved between the triple quotes. So if you wanted to, like, uh, I like, I like formatting this, right? It's like easier, especially like, you know, in my tool when I wrote a lot of Groovy scripts. I would actually uh, write some JCL in line in a Groovy script that I would submit to Jez, um, which is definitely possible with uh, Groovy and DBB. I won't try to pitch it too much. Um, but you know, with you really want to see the JCL formatted straight down, you know, and having it indented over on the variable declarations is a pain in the butt. But the problem is, if you just do a triple quote and then move line one down to line one, you've also inserted a new line at the beginning of that string. Now you can remove that new line by putting a backslash there. So even though you don't see the new line, you basically have staked the new line on that first line. So then. Now this is very nice because now I can see the exact format of the block of code, a block of uh, strings that I want to print out. Okay, um, native lists. Um, so again, all these things, you can use the Java equivalents. You can use a list interface, you can use the array list class or the, uh, the linked list class, however you want to do it, that's all perfectly valid to you. But if you're using Groovy, why not use a quicker, easier, simpler to understand? So Groovy uh, uses um, uh, an array notation. So this looks like an array, but actually it's an instance of list. So you define numbers equals uh, an array of uh, numbers, one, two, and three uh, of integers actually integer uh, classes, because they're all wrapped too. And you can do the assert. So numbers is an instance of a list. And you can do, uh, and you can use the numbers and all the methods of a list are available to you. So numbers.size equals three here. And I'm like, uh, and, and these are all like uh, object uh, lists, right? So you can have different types. Again, uh, Groovy is, uh, can be very dynamic. So in this case here, I've got an array of three different types. I've got an integer one, I've got a, a string A, and I've got a Boolean true. Um, and while the, uh, so it's of, uh, these creates a list interface, 
But the concrete class by default, if you don't say anything, will be an array list, a Java Util array list by default. But if you want to use different uh, types of lists as the concrete class, you can, can do that. You can just do it by casting it or using the coercion operator as. So in this case here, to define a, a variable linked list equals two, three, four as a linked list. And then you can assert linked list as an instance of a Java Util linked list. So I'll be talking about some operators later, but I don't really cover the as operator. Um, I usually just think of it as a casting operator, but there's a little bit more to it. They call it a coercion operator because casting really implies that they have a relationship. Um, but a Groovy can do some coercion where they're actually uh, cast, changing a value from one type to another that don't have a relationship because they have a lot of rules built in. So accessing list elements. Um, so here, uh, I just wanna show you some common methods on how you would access the, this list here. So here I've defined an array of strings, basically A, B, C, and D. Um, and I can use the standard array notation. It's zero based. So um, I can access it, you know, so letters uh, sub zero is A, letters sub one is B. Also, but they got some interesting things here. Um, I can use negative indexes that would actually start at the end of the array, um, starting with negative one. So letters sub negative one would be D, that's the last element of the array, and letters sub negative two uh, would be C. And you can see by doing some, you know, mathematical operations, looping through uh, a list, just by incrementing or decrementing the index would be very simple to do. Um, and you can use the, the, the index again to set values into the list too. So here, I went ahead and changed the lowercase c to an uppercase c, and you can assert that. And uh, you can use the uh, less than, less than operator to append items to the end of the list. Um, so I can just say letters, you know, less than, less than e, um, that appends e to the end, and then I can just assert that the last element, the negative one element is an e. Um, and they also have the same sort of thing with maps as well. In this case here, uh, maps are name value or key value pairs, um, but they're declared almost exactly the same way as an array is, except for that you have colons between the key and the value. Um, so you can see here, I've defined an empty map um, with just a uh, bracket colon, a closed bracket. Uh, and below that one, I have the colors, you know, red, green, and blue. Uh, the key is red, green, and blue, and the values are the FF00s, zero, zero, so, et cetera. And now uh, accessing, and some of this is a little bit different. Now, this actually creates a map that's of type string, string. So red, green, and blue are actually string keys, and the values are strings. So you can see that when we're trying to access it using the uh, index, we would say, you know, colors, sub string red, and then that would find the red string key, and then it'll pull back the value. But the other interesting thing with Groovy is you can just use the dot notation, uh, that, that, the member that way too. So you can just say colors.green, and that will find the green key and return the value of that too. Um, and you can assign new values here, and you don't have and to assign a new value, you just uh, access it. So in this case, colors sub pink is not in the array, but as soon as you've set a value to it, now it's in the array and it's been added to the, sorry, not the array, the map, and that's the value. And you can do exactly the same with the dot notation as well. Colors dot yellow has now created a new map entry where the key is yellow and the value is FFFF00. And in these above ones here, you can see that the key in this case, since we're using character values, they're all strings, but you don't have to use characters. You can use anything that can have a comparator to it. So you can use numbers. So in this case here, I can say define numbers. The keys are integer one, integer two. The values are string one and string two. And I can access them in exactly the same way with you know, the index one, and now it will pull back that uh, one value. 
Um, I just go through a couple of interesting operators that are introduced. Again, all the standard Java operators are valid in uh, Groovy, but Groovy has added some more powerful operators to make things easier to use without having to call a lot of methods. Um, the first one is called the Elvis operator. Um, and the reason why it's called the Elvis operator, because if you tilt your head, you can see the question mark colon looks a little bit like a, a two eyes with a little curly hair loop above it, like Elvis Presley, right? And the Elvis operator is sort of like a shortened version of the ternary operator, if you're familiar with the ternary operator. The ternary operator is like doing an inline if, uh, if then else assignment. So in this case here, you could see that I want to assign a value to display name. And I'm basically saying, well, the condition is if user dot name is not equal null, then the question mark says uh, this would be the true clause return user dot name as the value. And after the colon else return anonymous as the value. And this is very common in Java is that you're doing this all the time. I and mean, this is a very common test. If it's not null, return, you know, test the value. If it's not null, return the value. Otherwise, return another value. So the Elvis operator, they introduced this in Groovy, is just a shortcut version of this. Um, just say, basically saying if user.name is not null, and that user.name, you notice I don't have the not equals null in this one. And then I'll talk about that a little bit later about Groovy truth. This is where uh, they can look at variables that are not uh, Boolean expressions and tell whether it's true or false. And uh, in the case of a string, if the string has a length, if it's not null and it has length, then it would be true. So in this case, user.name, uh, Elvis operator anonymous. It's basically saying if user.name exists and has a value, return it automatically, otherwise use anonymous. Another very useful operator is called the safe navigation operator. And this prevents like intermediate null pointer exceptions from happening. You know, if you trying to get to a, a field within an instance class within another instance class, and you're not sure whether those instance classes are null, you pretty much have to test for null on every multiple times before you get to the actual value. Otherwise you'll get a null pointer exception. Uh, Groovy introduces this uh, state navigation operator question mark dot that would prevent that. So if it ever hits an intermediate null pointer, it would just return the value null to the value instead of having a null pointer exception. So in this case here, I've defined person and I've set it to null. And then I define name equals person with a name, uh, safe navigation operator question mark dot name. And basically what happens is instead of getting a null, per, null pointer exception because person was null, I just get the value null passed back to it. So it's a pretty powerful operator. Again, a lot of these operators are just solving some irritations in the, the, the Java language. A couple more, um, the range operator. Um, so you can set up, a, so there is a class called Groovy Lang range. So you can set up a range like from zero dot dot to five here. And if you were to turn this into a list, it would turn it into a list of uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five. So it's a range inclusive in this case. Uh, the second uh, example is showing you uh, a range where the, 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 lower, the, the lower limit is inclusive, but the upper limit is exclusive by using the less than sign. So in this case here, you go from zero dot dot less than five. So now we've got zero, one, two, three, four. Uh, the, the, the last operator, and there's a lot more operators that you should go take a look at, but the last operator we'll talk about is uh, the space, uh, spaceship operator is what it's known as. And it's basically a less than, equal, or greater than. It's basically just uh, another way to do in the compare to version operator. And it returns the, value, the standard value is zero for equality, negative one for the left side is less than the right side. One if the left side is greater than the right side, and you can see that it works also on uh, strings as well. Um, hey, hey, hey yes. Dan, it's Jimmy. Just want to give you a quick time check. You got five yeah. minutes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I might just go really quick over these things too. So maybe you can just look at the. I've uploaded the presentation, so you can get a, get a hold of that one. This is the groovy truth I was talking about. They've got some rules. 
So instead of you know saying name not equal null and name dot length is greater than zero, you can just say if name. Uh, same with collections, non empty collections and maps are true. Um, and same with uh, numbers. This is sort of like harking back to C. Uh, basically, non zero numbers would uh, assert to be true as well. Um, some just some quick overviews on method enhancements. Um, so you can define methods in Groovy uh, scripts, like we said. Um, but it brings in some new ideas that you see in other scripting languages, like one of the things that you uh, are like named parameters. Uh, and it does this by you define your method in Groovy with a map, but then you can see we're passing in a bunch of uh, key value pairs. Um, and then it understands that. So that's very useful, especially like in Java, where you end up having to do a lot of method overriding, uh, overloading, sorry to get all the parameters scenarios that you would want to do it. And sometimes it's not possible because you've got uh, two strings and then you got another one with two strings. The two different strings are exactly, they're totally different, but since they're the same type, you can't use method overloading. So this is where named uh, parameters come into play. And you can see this in Python quite a bit. It's very handy. Um, Groovy also has default arguments as well too. So you can put in a parameter list um, and then you can also say that, well, if you don't give me an age, a second parameter, I'm going to default to one. Um, when uh, in Groovy 2, you can say uh, like the parentheses in a method invocation are optional. So print line with the parentheses, hello world is also can be used as print line. You've seen it a couple of times in my uh, samples, hello world without the parentheses. That's still a method invocation. Um, and sort of harkening back to Pascal, um, you can see where you can also return um, more than one value from a method as well. So in this case, the method would be returning back an array of values. And when you invoke it, you can go ahead and use the parentheses and a list to uh, accept those values into it. Um, and the last thing I wanted to cover were closures. Now, closures in Groovy is, a, is an open anonymous block of code that can take arguments and return values. Um, so it's very similar to a method, but it's instantiated by a class. So it means you can assign it to a variable and you can pass it into methods. Um, so defining your own closures, I don't know. Uh, um, I don't see a lot of power in that one because I'd rather just use a method than a closure. But where I think closures come in really useful is when uh, other objects methods can take a closure. Um, and you can see this a lot in the list class, very useful for iterating through lists. So uh, like in the list class, uh, it, you can create this list called names and then there's this each method. Uh, so names.each, and it's going to iterate through the, each element in the list. And you can pass in a closure, um, in which case it will then pass in that value for each element into your closure, and then you can process. In this case, in the first example here, I'm just printing out uh, to standard out all the names in that array. And there's a couple other methods with closures that, that, that take closures for lists too, like the find all. In this case, you can set up a condition operator. In this case here, I've got an array of one, two, three, four, and um, I just want to find the even numbers. So I do a mod two, and I end up with an array that's just two, four. And finally, there's a reverse each, uh, which is just like the each method, but now it's interact, inter uh, iterating through the array in reverse order. So I can make it a, a reverse order uh, list. Um, Basically, we're done here. Um, there's more Groovy syntax to investigate um, that I, I recommend that you do. Um, there's regular expression native operators. You can create patterns, all sorts of built into Groovy. Groovy has native support for XML. You got uh, DOMs and you've got parsers and builders. Same with JSON. Uh, if you know Ant, uh, JSON, uh, Groovy has the Ant libraries built into Groovy, no XML on required. You've got a Groovy, Groovy, Groovyfied API to use Ant. So like Ant's got some interesting and useful methods like creating file sets. CLI, command line interface builder, all these Groovy scripts take arguments from the command line. 
they have a built-in CLI builder that helps you uh, parse the commands coming in with options like dash options and dash dash options, uh, validation on these parameters, printing out a help kind of screen. And then finally, we didn't go into it too much, domain-specific languages. Groovy lends itself to creating domain-specific languages. The two biggest ones you know about are probably Gradle, which is a Groovy domain-specific language, and also Jenkins pipeline scripts is also a Groovy domain-specific language. And I'm sorry, so this would be my last slide here. Um, so definitely go download the PDF. Um, and you can see I have links here for the Apache Groovy website, the language documentation, installing Groovy, the education, and the sample grooves, uh, Groovy scripts is a, a, a GitHub uh, project uh, for DBB of our sample application for building a ZOS application. It's got a lot of Groovy scripts, an example you can take a look at. Um, and that's it. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> A little over. Hey, not at all. Dan, that was awesome. Um, yeah. Does anybody have any questions uh, for Dan? If not, Dan, I have a. When you have to do your I icon, ICONV, um, there is a way I thought there's a variable called BPX underscore auto convert. Yes. Have you come across that or not? Yeah, yeah. And I, I did mention that briefly. I didn't go into details with it because there's a lot of steps to it. You've got to turn on BPX auto convert. You've got to uh, file tag those scripts, but it does, it definitely does work. But I found a couple of issues when I was testing it. Like when I ran the unzip, it was really weird. It, it did file tag all those scripts correctly to ISO uh, 8859-1, which is ASCII. But then it didn't say they were text files. So I had to go in and do a change tag to turn them into text files. So I'm not too sure what was going on with that. Um, also, I needed to change some permissions too. So you're right. You could do one of two ways there. Um, I think the most straightforward way is to do icon V. And that's what we do with our own Groovy installation that we ship with DBB. But you can definitely use BPXW Dyn. You'd have to set up some variables to handle that, but it's, it is totally feasible to do that as well. Okay, cool. I have one other question as well. If anybody else has a question, please say in the chat or um, I'm not sure if you have to ask to be unmuted. Um, one other thing I had, you talked about the doc profile and setting the Java home and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe that there is a, a sort of overriding, there is a precedence order if you have a dash Etsy dot profile, that that overrides, that that sets the environment for all of the users. So if you want to just have, put Java home across your entire system, that you can do it in the dash Etsy, but uh, th that's usually a bit more locked down in terms of permissions. So people tend to lock it in their home. Is that correct? So you should just, yeah, yeah, you, no, you can that, just that, put all that, those. Yeah, that's definitely correct. So some systems will set up Java home and they can have them set up Groovy home too. That was, uh, I did it into my dot profile because you know that's the way you could do it and play around and test with it and stuff like that too. Also, if you're running from a CI CD pipeline, you could have these all being set by the agent when the agent starts up as well. Okay, cool. And also you, you mentioned that after people edited it, it shell and go back in. They could have just written a dot profile there if they wanted to, they could just like, Done a slash tilde dot profile and just executed the file, right? Because it would have just exported within that shell. Yeah, I mean, and you could do this if 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 you were to wrap this into another shell script and execute the, another shell script, then it would all be in that one too. I have, I've had mixed success of trying to execute my docs profile while I'm logged in. Oh, uh, okay. To get it figured out correctly, you know. So it's always simpler for me to log out and log it back in again. Oh, well, let me know if you can figure it out because I have the same words as well. So <laughs> your, your samples were great. They were, they were around string manipulation and maps and a lot of the stuff that where scripting really helps. Yeah. So where's the best place? If somebody wants to do this on ZOS, they're probably going to want to use JSOS or they're probably going to want to interact with the OS. Can, is it on the previous slide you had? Is there a really good way? Where's the kind of hello world group script that says, I can just, you know, allocate a data set or 
or, or, or do so, but basically interact with JSOS. Um, yeah, so I didn't really uh, put that in there. Um, so the JSOS libraries, you can definitely look into it. And you want to look at the Z file class in the JSOS. Okay. And with that, you can you can get um, like byte streams, input streams and output streams to uh, data sets and stuff like that, too. Um, and I, I don't really have that example. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no worries, no problem. And with the JSOS, where else can you get to? Can you start doing things? Can you access JS? Can you access um, uh, TSO commands? Uh, so so with JSOS, console? there's a few things you can do, but it's sort of incomplete. Um, like I can, with JSOS, you could submit a JCL job and you could test to see whether it's done or not. But what you cannot do is retrieve the results. But the other thing about that is there is the, SDSF team have a Java library that you can use to retrieve results, but it does require to have SDSF installed on ZOS. Um, and then so of that's course, the SDSF, SDSF okay. Right. So those are part of the things, and there, and of course, there's the uh, ZOAU um, pack, uh, open, well, free version of ZOAU that does have Java and Python and command line APIs that also allow you to submit to J uh, JAZZ and a pullback and to work with uh, data sets as well. There's a couple different technologies that are available out there, but JSOS is nice because it's part of the IBM JVM. It's, it's just there. Yeah, that's really neat. I know because, yeah, it's great. And what, what you want about scripting is you don't want your scripts to have to prerequisite. I, right. I, I deal with this problem all the, all the time, right? You want to say, I'm just going to be able to work with the standard Born Shell or, you know, and, and Java and, and nothing else, right? If your script now has to drag in, you know, Metal C compilers or the script mm -hmm. has to grab in, uh, and that's kind of the Achilles heel of all of the, a lot of this next gen tooling, you know, like Ansible drags in Python, drags in blah, right. you, you know, all of a sudden, yeah, you, you can't just pushed in the door and it opens for you. And you want scripting to be your kind of advanced troops on the beach, right? You, you lay your scripts down so that you can bring another heavy up. And well, the other thing too is, and I didn't, I didn't show an example of this, but yeah, head, spring, you end up with a chicken and egg problem. Right. But another thing too is um, you can also call like commands uh, easily from Groovy. So you can have a, uh, like a CP command um, like a copy command that copy a file to a data set. Um, and then you put that into a string and Groovy, I, I, I didn't have a chance to put that in here, but I could just say like CP uh, USS file to data set member and then dot execute. And then that's all you need to execute that command on USS. So Groovy's got some pretty easy way to execute a USS command. Cool. Okay, thanks, Dan. That was awesome. If folks want to give feedback, it's 2AW and um, thank you. Um, and then just go back one more. You have, what's the best place for people to, to do more about this stuff? You have this repo. Well, I've got this uh, this slide here, which is towards the end with all these links and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, that's, that's the one I'm just going to. Mm -hmm. But it's all available already. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Sure thing. Yeah. Awesome. OK, if nobody's got any questions, I think, uh, think we're done. And okay. All right. Thanks. Cheers. Awesome. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Bye.